Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, and I am joined by Peter Kennedy of Subway Sports Talk podcast. What's up, Peter? Man, it's football season, but basketball season's knocking at the door. What better time to talk about some hoops than right now? Yeah, it has been such a slow summer, or maybe like the last month or so. And, you know, personally, I feel a little bit rusty. So I brought in Peter, who is constantly doing episodes about all sports in New York, et cetera. And, um, you know, to talk about, first and foremost, like the Eastern Conference, right? Like I'm doing Eastern Conference and then Western Conference. This is the Eastern Conference episode. And, He's an expert in this stuff. So I wanted to to ask him, like kind of go through predictions, rankings early on. It's it's that time of uh time of the season, the off seasons, preseasons rolling up and training camp. But first, first, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, as a Knicks fan, you know, we talked on your show about Donovan Mitchell and the Knicks, and that obviously did not happen. And he ended up going to the Cavs. You guys end up signing R.J. Barrett to a long-term expensive, pretty expensive deal. And, you know, like at first it's like, ooh, the Knicks lost out again. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. They might have dodged something too. What do you think? So it's really tough. And I'm, I'm torn on it myself a little bit because when I think about this as a Knicks fan and an NBA fan, you know, trying to put those thoughts together is a little bit difficult. And to start with the R.J. Barrett front, I am just very proud as a Knicks fan that we finally re-signed a first round draft pick. I mean, it's been over 20 years, Patrick, over Ooh. 20 years since the Knicks re-signed one of their own first draft, first round draft picks. Tim Hardaway is the only thing that almost kind of counts because they picked him in the first round, traded him away and then re-signed him back. But that doesn't even count. So getting RJ back and having him as a part of this franchise feels really good. He is the type of person you want as a cornerstone of your franchise. The question is, is he the type of player to be the lead player in your franchise, right? Like he's not a one. You and I talked about this on my show uh, a few months back. He's not a one, right? Can he be a good two? Can he be an awesome three? Those things seem realistic. Nonetheless, I'm thrilled to have a guy like him who just cares about getting better, cares about winning, plays hard every single night. So that right there is a win for Knicks fans. And I think NBA fans who have any familiarity with RJ Barrett would agree, even if they think there's some shortcomings in, in some of his efficiency numbers and all that stuff in in the Donovan Mitchell front. It's so hard because I like Donovan Mitchell a lot. I've been a huge fan of his since I saw him play in summer league way back when, and I've wanted him to succeed. I've always thought about him as a New York Nick, him being a tri-state area guy. Obviously he's, well, I don't know if it's obvious everyone to us, New Yorkers, it's obvious that he's a huge Mets fan. He loves New York. It always felt right. And then we talked about it for so damn long that we felt like it needed to happen. However, putting back on my NBA hat and not my Knicks fan hat, I think that there's a reasonable argument to be made that he's not the be all end all and not getting him is not some sort of failure. It's not the end of the world. It is just, uh, you know, one door closes, another one opens for different opportunity. Now, it still stings to not get that guy because how many times has Knicks fans said, oh, well, we didn't get this star. We'll probably get the next one. And then they never get the next one either. So getting him would have been a win. It would have been strenuous on the assets from a picks perspective, from a filling in the roster perspective. But I don't think he is by himself a big enough force for the Knicks fans to be incredibly upset about this. It's like like something that you're hopeful for you would have liked to see happen, but it doesn't mean that this offseason was a failure. It doesn't mean that this team is going to be a disaster this year. A lot of new pieces, Jalen Brunson obviously being the the highlighter there. Uh, and then a lot of guys who we kind of like that got a chance, who now get a chance to uh, improve upon their rookie or sophomore seasons like Quentin Grimes and Obi Toppin, Emmanuel Quickly, et cetera. So there's reasons to be optimistic as a Knicks fan. It stings, but I'm okay with it because Mitchell fits better in Cleveland. And we'll talk about that, obviously, when we go through the Eastern Conference preview. It makes way more sense, and the backcourt of Garland and Mitchell is better than the backcourt of Brunson and Mitchell and Brunson, Mitchell, Barrett. What happens there defensively? We'll get into all that minutia, if you will, but (laughs) I I don't think he was such a home run to make this team 
a top four team in the Eastern Conference. And that's why as Knicks fans, we have to be okay with not getting him. Yeah, I, I agree with that. My first reaction was like, ooh, the Knicks, they whiffed again. But, you know, the same way that I talked to you about how the 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 Brunson Mitchell backcourt might, you know, would have defensive problems. It works in Cleveland. Again, we'll talk about this later. Uh, that's actually a smaller backcourt, I think. I think, right? Because at least Brunson has more like heft to him. Uh, they're probably Earth. the same size. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, that's good because I, I was like, yeah, I mean, Mitchell's great, but it's like, it, it's almost the way Warriors fans, some Warriors fans, uh, looked at Bradley Beal a couple summers ago. It's like, uh, you know, I've never looked at Bradley Beal as like this top tier talent. It was just, he was the one available who was leading the league in scoring at the time. I'm like, but he's he's not a good fit. You know what I mean? Like he's not, like he can put up points. He's a, He's an excellent player, but he's not that. He's not that. So, you know, it's uh, the long view. I, I think that's a, a, a good thing. And uh, I, I tend to agree with you. I don't want it to be unsaid that he made them better. That's undoubtable. And he does fill or he would have filled an important role of being that crunch time scorer for them. Because if you watch them over the past couple of years, when, especially the first year with Tibbs when they were winning games frequently, last year not as good, their big issue was if Julius Randle didn't hit crazy turnaround jump shots from the corner late in games, their offense looked stagnant. Mitchell would have 100% helped with that, but all the other stuff would have probably balanced it out to some perspective that Knicks fans would have been a little bit let down with. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, I, I see that too, but like, to me, it's like the, the stuff that they would have had to give up. I just don't think that's, that's where I, I said, yes, he would make them uh, more fun, but like their ceiling would still be too low for what it was worth, in my opinion. Was your instant reaction like, damn? Or was it like, okay, I you, mean, were I got, you were upset. You were upset at first. I'd gone through the entire gamut of emotions with that. I, <laughs> if you looked at my Subway Sports Talk Instagram, I did a video during the first round of the playoffs saying how Knicks fans need to be big Dallas Maverick fans so the Mavericks can eliminate the Jazz and then Mitchell wants to leave and come to New York. That was like pie in the sky that could happen. It'll be beautiful for Knicks fans. And then it actually happened. The Jazz lost to the Mavs, even without Doncic for a couple of days there. And I was like, wow, it could happen. And then all the rumors start swirling. But then the Danny Ainge factor comes into play where he clearly didn't want to just hand Mitchell to the Knicks. And whether the Knicks package was better or worse, you already mentioned a lot of those assets being lost makes it harder to remain super competitive. Yeah. So it was totally a mixed bag. Yeah. As an individual I would have loved to have Mitchell in New York would have been so exciting. I mean, he would have been an all-star in New York and that just feels bigger than him being an all-star in Utah or Cleveland, no offense. And it, it would have been special. However, there's the other side of me that said, okay, this is fine. This is okay. We didn't get this guy. We have to get other guys. We have to keep building. So yeah. I was pretty even keeled once it happened. I think because we talked about it at nauseum for two months until <laughs> the season trade actually happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On that note, let's uh, let's get into these uh, Eastern Conference uh, predictions. I mean, I'm curious, you know, I want to I see how you're seeing this. I want to see where you put your Knicks, too. <laughs> so uh, starting off at number one, I basically looks like playoff seating or predicting playoffs, seating, play-in. Number one, who, Peter, do you have as the, the top team in the, in the East? I'm going to go with the Milwaukee Bucks as the number one team in the East, and that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be the number one seed. However, I think it'll be fair to say they're number one in the playoff power rankings, right? So if you look at Vegas right now, they have the Boston Celtics as the highest projected win total across mm -hmm. the league, not just the Eastern Conference at 55 and a half, followed by the Milwaukee Bucks at 52 and a half, a, a decent chunk difference there between number one and number two. But I, I think the pedigree of Giannis reigns supreme, the health of Chris Middleton, if that is, uh, if that is there, they are better than Boston. And I think they would be looked at as the true number one contender in the Eastern conference. I could totally hear the argument for the Celtics being the better regular season team this year, but it's not like the Bucks are a type of team that has taken their foot off the gas uh, particularly in the regular season. Last year, their record not being the number one seed was largely in part because of injury. 
So if they're healthy, I still think the East goes through Giannis, it goes through Milwaukee, and then the Bucks and some other, I'm sorry, the Celtics and other teams, you start vying for number two and three in the teams we expect who can actually win a, a championship. Yeah, I actually agree. I, I have the Bucks as one. And you make a, a good point, a good distinction there. Like, I mean, we, we, we all know, uh, unless you're a Celtics fan, we all know that if Chris Middleton was healthy in the playoffs, the, <laughs> the Bucks are playing in the finals, right? So, and uh, what, what the Bucks have, even though they just have one title, is like they have the confidence to me of, of having won a title. They have the confidence of having arguably one of the best players in the league, depends on any given day on who does what on what night. But they have that, they have that guy. And to to me, it's like the the Celtics. Oh, they have so many question marks, right? They they like they didn't they didn't do it. They didn't beat the Warriors. They didn't win the title. There's questions on everybody's doubting if they could have beaten the Bucks. So I actually agree that it might be because the Celtics are that team that want to prove that they are the best. Will come out trying to win every game, whereas the Bucks, they kind of do could do what the Warriors have done over the years, which is like okay, we want to be healthy. Chris Middleton, we learn from this. It's like we pace, we end up in the top two, maybe top three if that has to happen, but we are ready for 16 wins. And so like, I think the Bucks are the best team in the East. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll put them as, as one in that respect as well. But yeah, I agree. Like if they don't end up that way, I can see the Celtics being the team that's just like, like still insecure about themselves and needing to show the league that they are good. So we're going to dominate. It's kind of like the Suns, right? Last last season, right? Exactly. Like, uh, they get a little bump from the experience. They're like, we're young. We're, we're the up and coming team. And we're going to show it until we prove we're not those guys in the playoffs again. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? It, it's interesting that you bring up the Suns. I was about to do the same. If you look at the past three years of championships in the NBA, so you go back to the bubble season, Lakers take down uh, the Heat. The Heat in that following year didn't quite have the juice to maintain a regular season, to have it all together in the playoffs. Yeah, the roster changes year over year for sure. Last year, the Bucs, uh, I'm sorry, this last year, the Suns in the finals, you know, they lose to the Bucs. They didn't quite have the same juice. They had that regular season dominance where they showed up every night expecting to win, and they did so for a large portion of the season. But in the playoffs, they didn't quite have that same juice, and it's because it's such a grind. And that what that's what makes the Warriors run and the Cavs run when they went four in a row against each other so damn incredible with, with really some minor retooling, I would say, too. It's not like the Warriors roster got completely overhauled over those four or five seasons. It's not like the Cavs roster outside of you know the final year without Kyrie got completely overhauled very often. So... Those teams are the exceptions and the standard when it's not some sort of dynastic run is it's really hard to make it all the way to the promised land or to the finals in general two years in a row. So this is a chance for the Celtics to shut me up and establish themselves as the next three years they're expecting to be in conference finals and finals. But until they do that and they overcome Giannis again and again, I'm not going to sit here and say, I expect that to happen. Because mm -hmm. I do expect, like you said, with Middleton being healthy, that would have been very different last year. Yeah, yeah. Well, that brings us to number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, number two is the, number two is the Celtics, right? <laughs> At the same time, with what I just said, it's gonna be victory. You also have to respect the the greatness of what they did last year. The only thing strange about their season last year, and it's so easy to forget, they were super, super mediocre for the first two months of the season. Like mm -hmm. we were saying, Ime Udoka doesn't have it. All right, they officially have to consider trading Jalen Brown. They need a point guard. What is Marcus Smart right now? And then by the end of the season, they had the best record for the final five months of the year or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Marcus Smart's defensive player of the year. Jason Tatum, is he top five? I mean, there's 15 top five players in the NBA, depends who you ask. Um, <laughs> like Jalen Brown is back and he's okay now. Like That's all fine and dandy. So I still think they deserve the respect yeah. of number two. But the problems that were taken into account when the Warriors got got their hands on the Celtics are going to still be there. And it won't matter when the Celtics are playing the Detroit Pistons, who will be frisky. We'll get them down later. Mm -hmm. It won't matter when they're playing the Kings or et cetera. But when they are playing the Bucks and the Sixers and the Warriors and the Clippers, 
can Jalen Brown put the ball on the ground? Like that was something that came to the the forefront last year. Can he dribble more than twice and be effective? Can is he going to lose the ball? What is uh, Marcus Smart look like now in his second year in this finally established point guard role? Role. Uh, so there, there's a lot of question marks. Um, they did bring in, and it's it's slipping my mind now too. Derek White obviously last year, and they brought in one more guard now that is completely slipping my mind. I'll pull it up in a second here. Um, so that they didn't do nothing. Oh, Malcolm Brogdon, mm-hmm. and, and I love Malcolm Brogdon. If he's healthy, he's fantastic for them. Right. So that, that's a win to have Malcolm Brogdon around. Um, but again, it, it comes down to health. Brogdon's injury prone. Robert Williams is injury prone. Uh, though Hal Horford is one year older. Grant Williams got exposed in the playoffs a little bit uh, last year, so I don't expect that to be super meaningful for for 82 but i do expect that to be meaningful throughout that and after that into the playoffs and i think it'll be a conversation throughout the year if they lose big games if yeah. they do you know lose in prime time those will be some of the conversations we have because it's easy to forget how weird their first two months of the season were last year because we look at all the positives that came towards the end okay <laughs> number three who do you got number three uh i think it can go one of two ways here. I don't think there's, I think there's a clear, I'll say this before I say who my number three is. I think there's a clear top four right now. And then there's some variants with five and six who have, you know, a puncher's chance to make it into that top four. But I think if you take the Bucks and Celtics out of it, three and four in some order should be the Sixers and the Heat. The Sixers are so easy to be a punching bag in this league because of, the Ben Simmons debacle, and then James Harden coming in and looking great against the Kings and terrible in the playoffs. Like that's just James Harden at this point in time. However, I do expect them to be a regular season beast again. I expect them to be very good in the regular season. And I think I put them ahead of the Miami heat. So I'm going to put the Sixers at three, the heat at four. um, Just because I think Embiid, man, he has that eye of the tiger where (laughs) He hears every piece of noise. He hears every uh, doubt that comes his way. And he's proven nothing other than taking that and fueling it into success on the court. His health hasn't been an issue. I don't expect it to be. So I I do think that the Sixers are poised for a really nice season here. And like, it's so weird to, to feel positively about them because of all the negativity that comes around them. But when Mm -hmm. you look at this roster, you get one more year of Tyrese Maxey getting better and better. That is the key. It's Tyrese Maxey being a near all-star level guard on this team. So whether James Harden is James Harden or, you know, the, the fat version of James Harden, I don't know what you want to call him. Like they're going to be very good. They have an MVP candidate. They have some role players. They bring in P.J. Tucker to be that defensive anchor, corner three-point shooter, uh, professional, who's just solid throughout. But the key for them is Tyrese Maxey. He will be a a 20-point-a-game scorer this year. He's going to be fast. He's going to help them move the ball in transition, which is something they haven't done much since Ben Simmons hasn't played for them. And that'll be the key for them to just dominate the regular season. And I could easily see them in the two-seed or, or the one seed for that matter. They've been there before. It was only two years ago where they went into the playoffs as the one seed. So I love them uh, in the regular season and the hardened playoff question marks will remain until proven otherwise. So uh, Sixers with all the negativity will be a very good basketball team come a few weeks. Hey man, I had the Sixers at three as well. Um, and, and the heat at four. So with James Harden, it's like, okay, so you have Embiid and Maxi love those guys. Harden that's the uh, X factor to me because, like you said, are we getting like uh, Harden uh, from end of the Rockets era or are we getting fat Harden? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the thing is, like with, with James Harden, it's like, I don't know. I don't know because he is what, 31, two, something like that. He's like yeah. Clay Thompson's age or something. He hasn't proven yet that he's the guy to like, you know, get into the best shape. He, he, what kind of guy is he going to be heading into his mid thirties? Obviously the Sixers who just gave him a contract, hope that he gets back to who he was, but you know, that's, that's what's the big question mark for me. But to me, it's like, uh, yeah, Embiid, Maxi, and Harden that is either, 
you know, like hopefully he'll be motivated to be at least 70% or higher of who he was. I think that that's a pretty solid trio. And just like, you know, the Celtics are out, some, out to prove something, I think Embiid is definitely out to prove something. And I'm actually really looking forward to that because I want to see how much better he he can be, you know? It's bizarre to think that he's added stuff to his game every year because he's been so good for so many years now. But every year he's been getting a little bit better. And I'm waiting for the year where that three-point shot um, becomes more of a scarce weapon to an actual weapon yeah. where he's hitting that with consistency and constantly. And that becomes dangerous for opponents. I mean, seriously. And I, I think it doesn't get said enough about James Harden, how many minutes this guy's played. I mean, he has over 32,000 regular season minutes and he's been in as many playoff series at this point as anybody in the league, not named Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Steph Curry. Like he has those yeah. playoff minutes as well, as much as literally as much as anybody outside of those guys and Chris Paul, if I didn't mention him yet. Mm-hmm. So the, the wear and tear is really on him. He's 33 years old now, actually. Ooh, yeah. Um, so it's, it's a lot of minutes, man. And and still with that being said, his pick and roll efficiency with Joel Embiid was number one in the NBA last year when they were together. Mm-hmm. Right. So what, what matters more? Is he going to be able to be that efficient, you know, hyper score facilitator, or is he just going to be the efficient facilitator with some scoring punch, right? Mm-hmm. Cause that's what happened uh, in the past couple of years, whether it be in Brooklyn or then Philadelphia, he always had that creation aspect. He had the ability to make amazing passes and find open shooters and find Embiid and whatever. It's the ability for him to get to the basket. The free throw attempts have been going down, down, down. Right. Um, a little, well, you know, since 2019, his last full year in Houston, um, then he's from 10 to seven that down to uh, 6.9, then 7.9 last year, or I'm sorry, those are free throws made. I wasn't counting attempts, but you get the idea. Yeah. Um, so what is he going to be just yeah. the facilitator or is he going to be a 25 point a game guy again? If he's a 25 point a game guy, watch out. This team's going to crush people all season long. Yeah. I mean, his free throws have gone down also because of the the way they're calling the game a little bit more. True. And uh, they yeah. were, they would be, they should be even lower, but I think they started giving Trey Young and, uh, and Harden and Chris Paul more calls towards the, the second half of last season. But it's interesting. So you point out he's 33. It's like, and he is not known for being athletic or particularly like you don't hear, Oh, the James Harden, he's, he's working out. He's getting into shape. Like, you know, the argument for LeBron James is because he's a freak of nature, but also he works really hard on his body. Steph Curry is probably the best conditioned athlete in the league based on how much he runs and how much he has to do and how far he has to shoot and, and keeping his form and all that stuff. So like James Harden has, has never, never been that. And it could be that he does end up being that 25 point per game guy. I wouldn't necessarily put money on that, but it could also be that he, you know, falls off continuing on the, uh, the downside of his career. He becomes the unathletic Russell Westbrook version of falling off. Oh God. Oh God. Oh no. (laughs) So I don't know if you know this about me, Patrick, I've been, I've been a bit of a James Harden Stan. Oh my my career in podcasting. I mean, I remember that Russell Westbrook triple double MVP season on my podcast, uh, at that point, it was called something different, but uh, I was just, I couldn't say it enough that James Harden was the MVP, that he was way, that he was better, more efficient, more impactful, more winning than Russell Westbrook. I couldn't say it enough. And I thought his playoff shortcomings were always overblown. And, you know, I, I always stuck up for him. It became really hard to do so, however, over the past two seasons to continuously stick up for him. The one thing that's the silver lining in James Harden really phasing into this latter part of his career is that Tyrese Maxey's there. Yeah. And if that really can take some pressure off and he actually chooses to shoot spot up threes, like if you really watch the Sixers and you watch James Harden, he doesn't shoot catch and shoot very often. Mm-hmm. Very, very seldom does he catch and just go right up with it. Usually it's off a rebound, offensive rebound, where they kick back out to him and he'll let it fly. Even still sometimes he'll pump take his dribble, step back, and shoot. Like, I want to see him expand that game. His game's been so cerebral, so impressive for so many years now. He needs to add something new. And Carmelo Anthony's a bad comp because he's much older and it's different. But Carmelo realized quickly 
Well, no, actually, it wasn't that quick. It took a little while. <laughs> it, took, it took him getting out of the league, right? <laughs> it took him two years and getting kicked out of the league. Yeah, it took him until he got to Portland, realistically, right. for him to accept that role. Okay, I am a spot-up three-point shooter. I am going to post up on occasion with success, and yeah. I need to just compete on defense, right? Harden's not quite at that point yet. He's, they, they still need him to create a lot. Right. But he needs to add one of those other things to his game. I think the big one is catch and shoot. Just Just do it more. You're yeah. pretty good at it. Do it, do it more frequently. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I I was never a, a Harden fan, but I do agree that uh, he probably deserved that MVP more than Russ because I'm even less of a Russ fan. Because <laughs> basically, yeah. that season he was chasing stats on a non-winning team, and um, you know that 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 is what it is. Anyway, that's, uh, right. that's the Lakers' problem now. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. All right, moving on to number four. So uh, we actually both had the Heat. Yeah, the Heat. It's it, they were the one seed last year, right? They were the mm-hmm. one seed last year. They came up short in the playoffs. They they had a chance to take down Boston. That was an extremely competitive series. And the the big issue for them is is health and age. It's health and age. Jimmy Butler, Kyle Lowry are old. They are. Yeah, they're right up there with minutes with, with the Harden crowd, with that old group I explained before, mm-hmm. uh, Chris Paul, Steph, LeBron, KD, all that stuff. They have minutes on minutes on minutes on their on their books. That's going to be tough. Does Oladipo come back and be a real part of this team? I hope so. I don't know so. I don't know. I'm actually, I'd be willing to drop them down to five for the next team, but out of the respect for Jimmy Butler, who constantly proves us wrong every time we say he's shot, Every time we say he's done, he gets more efficient. He gets tougher. He wins more games. So he gets the benefit of the doubt. I need to see what happens with this point guard position. Kyle Lowry was not the reason why they were the one seed last year. And, you know, he had his moments. He had his steadying nature as that veteran point guard. Um, But I I don't trust him to be the number one point guard on a top two or three seed in the the, uh, Eastern Conference. So I have nerves about this team. I do, however, think their infrastructure is so good. I think Bam Adebayo is moments away from taking another leap forward offensively. The passing is there. He is offensively, he is Jokic light. Uh, and that I say that with like the utmost respect and caution because Jokic is probably my favorite player to watch in the league, him and Steph Curry. So Bam has a lot of those traits. He hasn't figured out how to uh, put it together consistently. And if you think about Jokic's trajectory, what his big question marks were when he first became like an all-star level player was when is he going to decide to take over games? When is he going to just score more, right? Remember in the first couple of years of Jokic being good, yo, shoot more, get more shots up, take control, be, be aggressive, be assertive. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it started clicking. Now he's attacking. Now he's getting to the line, the three point ball. He has better than Bam, but Bam has a lot of those same tools in the tools toolbox. And I expect the facilitation and more of this offense to run through him, his numbers are going to go up, and Jimmy needs him to do so. So part of it is respect to a team that was very, very good last year with a chance to make the finals, and part of it is a leap from Bam out of bio that I expect any day now, any mm-hmm. any season now. It could happen this one, it could happen the next one, but Bam will be an offensive superstar at some point. I just don't know if it happens now or later. Yeah. You know, like um, it's, it's funny because I look at the Heat and – like the infrastructure, the culture, Pat Riley, all that stuff. That That is clearly the thing that ties them together all the time. I feel like what stops them is, and I know they almost made the finals, but that's because of how hard they play and they do have talent. But what they are to me is like a team that once they get deep in the playoffs, will never have the best player in the series. And I think that will always be kind of be a, a, a cap on them. I actually, I think you said that your first maybe like slash like was like three or f- four. Mine was four or five. And, and I know that you said like you could swap them with five. So I could too, because I'm just not sure about the, I, I had concerns about their age and can Jimmy Butler do it again? It's Kyle Lowry kaput. I mean, <laughs> if you rely on Oladipo, I mean, I, I I would love to see Oladipo come back and, and have some of that uh, uh, game that he had before he he, uh, he busted his quad, but that's that just doesn't mean a lot to me. And I think Bam could be great and amazing. I haven't seen what you're talking about in terms of his 
offensive side. So I would, I would love to see that. That could be a game changer for me, but like they're a team that I think, you know, they, uh, in the bubble, they, they got there, uh, and they lost, uh, last season. They almost got there again. I feel like something's going to have to happen. Like in, 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 like you're saying, Bam has to take that next step to the next level, uh, for them to really just try to assert themselves again, because there's all these other teams that are already established or are just younger and, and getting better. That's why I kind of have them in this middling area. And I could convince myself, uh, to, to drop them based on a, a sexy team that's younger and that might, uh, 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 get, get past them. Yeah. And, and the other question is Tyler hero, right? He was their, uh, second leading scorer last year in the regular season. Uh, just behind Jimmy Butler, but he also played thir- uh, 10 more games, give or take, than Jimmy. So he really was their go-to guy as a yeah. scorer for a lot of the season, even though Jimmy gets a lot of the late possessions and stuff. But the playoff stuff is a little bit scary when it comes to Tyler Hero. I mean, he was a 20-point-a-game guy all regular season long, and then all of a sudden in the playoffs, a little bit tighter defense, a little bit more game planning, a little bit more Jimmy Butler. And you know, not only did his numbers go down, but his efficiency went down, right? Like if he was just getting less touches and shooting similar clips to what he did all regular season, there's not as much reason to be nervous about it, but his minutes went down every series. His points per game went down uh, to under 10 in that Eastern conference finals. And and again, it's not all for, for one reason or not. It's, it's for a multitude of reasons, but we all said it with Tyler hero during the season and it became true in the playoffs. What is a team that the best option or the second best option is uh, a not super physical undersized guard who is a a creator. Right. And that came to fruition. I mean, 28 minutes in the first series, only 13 points per game. Like that is not Tyler hero of the regular season. So what, what does that mean for them? Are they still pushing him more out into the forefront to be that scorer for them? Or are they saying, yo, you are great at your role. We need to find someone else to pick up the rest of the offensive slack. I think it's more of the latter, but we'll see. Anyway, who you got at five? But they might but they might not have a choice, right? Like they might not have a choice. Yeah. You might still be the best option. So that's the oh, tough yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they may not have anybody. Exactly, exactly. And that's why at number five, I'm going with Cleveland and I'm I'm very close. I honestly in the moment, I want to put them at four. I actually, in hindsight, they're my number four team. This team won 43 games last year and they basically, I'm sorry, 44 games last year and they basically fell apart at the end of the season when Mobley got hurt. Um, Ricky Rubio obviously hurt earlier in the season. They were not the same team at the end as they were in that beginning first couple months. Now with Donovan Mitchell, this team is better and Mobley and Jared Allen are the most perfect type of people to play around Uh, Garland and Mitchell because they make up for so much of that defensive issue uh, those defensive issues you get Mitchell and Garland now really guarding the three-point line because Mobley and Allen have the paint on lock I think Mm -hmm. this team's going to be really really good I don't think their ceiling is as high as the Bucks and Celtics or even the Sixers but I do think their ceiling is as high as the Miami Heat if not higher And, and Mobley is the question just like Bam Adebayo is the question for the Heat. What does he do to take a leap? If Mobley becomes a more uh, offensive focus and with success, man, they are going to be scary and really annoying to play every single night. With those two guards getting to their spots and getting off great shots, offensively, it's going to be a nightmare. And defensively, you have two of the better rim protectors on your team in Mobley and Allen. So, I look at this Cleveland Cavaliers number. Vegas has them at 46 and a half, uh, which obviously popped up about, you know, three or four wins when once they acquired Donovan Mitchell. And I'm like, why not? Why can't they win 50 games? I see them as a team that it's not hype. It's not, oh, the new shiny toy because they got a new all-star. This team is really balanced, really talented. Uh, if they had Ricky Rubio off the bench as point guard, I would love it even more but they're they're just freaking solid, man. And Kevin mm-hmm. Love off the bench, Robin Lopez off the bench. They got dudes to make up for it when the big guns got to take a rest. They're they're balanced, they're good, and they got not one but two big time scoring punches now. I'm I'm doing it right now, Patrick. They're number four for me. Okay. Heck the heat. Heck the heat. They're now my number four. I'm changing <laughs> it. Live. Well, to to change it up, I will keep them at five. They were on my list. Heat slash Cavs. 
for it's for the same same reasons. I think they're good. The backcourt with those two guys. I mean, everything you just said. Just that when when that trade happened, I, I was like, oh man, that solves their problem, right? That's the one thing <laughs> the Knicks. Not the one thing, but that's one thing the Knicks didn't have was like these two big dudes uh, at the four and five to 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 help on defense. But the way this team fits, and I can appreciate the Cavs going for it. Like, was Mitchell worth all those picks? We'll find out because they are young and they don't have to worry as long as people stay healthy. They don't have to worry about those picks so much per se. And it's like they have their franchise guy, right? They have their franchise guy in Mobley. You have like kind of a secondary franchise guy in the, or, and tertiary in Garland and, uh, and Mitchell now. And, you know, I, I can easily see them getting up to the the four spot. So like, it's, it's going to be fuzzy there. I'll just say five. Cause I'll say Pat Riley. <laughs> uh, uh, track record says that you could, you'll probably be right on that one. Right. So oh, I do have a question for you though, because yeah. it's something I heard about. Um, it was Bill Simmons talking through his trade value comment, um, col- uh, column. I'm not yeah. sure if you're familiar with the trade value. Uh, yeah. So basically he ranks players s- yep. specifically off of what they are valued of to their own team, teams around the league, what would be traded for, et how much, how much they make, what the contract and salaries are like. Yes, yeah. it's not just who's the best player. Right. It, by no means is that actually. It's very different. But he had Evan Mobley about seven or eight spots above Cade Cunningham and Scotty Barnes which is something that I vehemently disagreed with. But yeah. There are a lot of people out there who see Mobley's efficiencies. They see the way he moves on defense and are just like incredibly impressed as, as am I, I like him. However, I don't think I could ever put him above a Cade Cunningham. Cause I think Cade is going to blow up this year and be an absolute stud. He was very good last year. Um, do you imagine him ever taking a role that's bigger than a uh, secondary tertiary offensive player. Uh, I, I don't know if I could, yeah, Mobley. I don't know if I could see him averaging 23 points a game or being a go to scorer. I always see him just fitting in so well. And in that regard, he's amazing to have on your team 100%. Yeah. But like putting him next to Cade and Scotty Barnes, who do so much, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I can fathom that. I don't think I can agree with that. Yeah, I mean, he's always Bill Simmons has always been high on Mobley. I have been like you know regular high on Mobley because when I watched him play, uh, I don't watch college basketball as much as I used to. But when I watched him play at USC, I was like, okay, I can see the tools and I can see like you know how he could be this great NBA player. I, I don't know if I would have had him that high, but I can see him scoring. Uh, 23 points, maybe not next year, maybe not the year after, but I can definitely see him doing it. But I kind of like Cade more and um, I put Mobley and Barnes kind of closer together uh, in that respect. Uh, Man, I love Barnes. I love Barnes. Like he was the guy before people started talking about him in the 2021 draft as like, oh, he's sneaking up to like the uh, he was the guy that I wanted the Warriors to get at seven. I'm happy right. as hell with Kaminga, but like Barnes just has, I mean, everybody talked about how he couldn't shoot. Dude shoots fine. Like he doesn't have a broken yeah. uh, uh, shot and he just needs more reps. But like, yeah, I love those guys. I would still take take Cade, but um, I'm curious to see uh, if, if Mobley evolves into that. You know, like Mitchell seems like a guy who can – pass him the ball he's not like a, a a huge ball hog so uh we'll see we'll see we'll see how that goes yeah and mobley for the cavaliers if you're drafting your player for the Cavs specifically with the roster around it mobley's the pick yeah because if you yeah. have garland mitchell and Cade, you're like somebody's not being used to their full potential you could 100 percent get the full potential out of garland mitchell and mobley mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. for the Cavs, it makes the utmost sense and all the uh, non scoring stuff that Mobley does is another reason why I expect them to win over 46 games this year and be a lock for those top four or five seeds. As a Warriors fan, I grew to despise the Cavs and their fans, but just as a pure basketball fan, when they, when they got Mobley, um, and they had started this core of this team. I like, I really, really want them to do well. You know, I want 
the Cavs. I have this tendency to to, to want like the the downtrodden teams to rise up. Maybe it's because the Warriors were god awful for my whole life, you know. But uh, uh, I hope they do. I hope they do well. I hope they like make a bunch of noise in the playoffs. That would be really really like entertaining for for me because I get tired of some of these. Uh, uh, you know, as much as I think the the Heat have what it takes to to be at number four. I get bored watching the heat, man. Yeah, they're not that exciting. They're really not. They're impressive. They're not exciting. And I agree. Yeah. Plus for you, and obviously you'd speak to this better, but these Cavs are not those Cavs. They're very yeah. different. It's yeah. like, it's almost rooting for a different franchise at this point. It's yeah. no LeBron, no, no real Warriors beef between any of those players. I mean, right. Kevin Love is the only guy remaining. Chetty Osman, if you if you want to go there too. Um, the Dan Gilbert. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's about the owner. It's always, it always has been. Uh, but with Mitchell too, he has playoff chops. Yeah. Like he has never been the reason why they've come up short in the playoffs. He's been the reason why they've won playoff series, why they've been in playoff series. So when it comes down to it, I mean, he's the guy who they're probably going to throw the ball to late in the game to make something happen. I mean, they have him and Garland to do so, but Mitchell's a little bit more physical, get the line a little better. So, you and, know, they can make noise. Why not? I don't want to play them. I'm being honest. Like Mobley from an impact standpoint could remind me of a Draymond. He's much more uh, fluid offensively, but impactful wise, he can do a lot of those same things. And no one, no one is Draymond green. I'm not going to speak that blasphemy on the Oakland Warriors podcast, <laughs> but from an impact perspective, he checks a lot of the same boxes from just making the perfect passes constantly, making amazing reads defensively. He does a lot of those things that don't show up in the box score that really help a team. So they're going to be super fun. And I don't think it's I don't think it's the new thing in the world, the new buzz hype. I think it's hype that is very much so deserving from Cleveland. Yeah, I mean, I think Mitchell has to play better defense, but of course he has two guys behind him. But like, I think obviously that was like his big uh, flaw in in the playoffs and whatnot. And in terms of Mobley, again, I need to watch him more in the pros because uh, I had league pass last year and I'm like, I'm going to watch all these games, all these teams. And then all of a sudden I was like covering every Warriors game and I was like, I, I have no time or desire to watch anyone else. But I want to watch Mobley more because like, just in his demeanor, you know, like what does demeanor mean? But like, you know, it it could be blasphemy to say like he has like these kind of Tim Duncan like vibes to him just in terms of like his, the way he carries himself. I could be wrong. I could have not watched him enough, but you know, like when people are so high up on somebody, it's like, what am I missing? You know? And I'm like, is, is there something there? But like, what is it? I remember uh, when Duncan was at Wake Forest, everybody's like, Oh, he's amazing. He's so good. And I was like, you know, he, he was, he was great, but I'd seen more spectacular athletes and dominant performances in college basketball. But what you didn't realize was like his just competitiveness and his uh, fundamentals were just obviously so, so solid. And, and I'm not saying that Mobley is Tim Duncan, but like maybe there's something there that, that I need to look at more, more closely. Yeah, and if he could start to shoot a little bit, goddamn, watch out. Yeah. Watch yeah. out. All right. Um, moving on from the Evan Mobley podcast, um, <laughs> uh, number six. If I had any gut in me right now, this team <laughs> would have been like number three or four because I'm going to talk I'm going to talk about them with a pie-in-the-sky mentality if things were to go well, and I think you might know who I'm talking about. It's the Brooklyn Nets. Yeah. The Brooklyn Nets – are on paper so good they're so talented patrick like mm -hmm. you think about ben simmons he has the worst rep in the entire nba right now but god damn is he good at what he's good at he's so good at what he's good at and if he does those things invaluable to the brooklyn nets specifically too kevin durant kyrie irving are good in transition when kd's out in transition i mean it's filthy right but when they have a guy who can really push the ball like Ben Simmons can in transition, they can be so dangerous. And the other thing for the Nets on a comeback front is not just Ben Simmons, it's Joe Harris. Now, if Joe Harris is back and shooting the lights out like he has in his career, it's Seth Curry and Joe Harris who can just light it up from deep. And that allows Ben Simmons to basically play point center, right? 
So Nick Claxton is basically the uh, de facto center right now. We'll probably start the year for them, start most of their games at center, unless they, they figure something else out. Ben Simmons in that lineup with him and KD kind of shoring up the paint as, as like uh, uh, paint defenders, that can be a deathly lineup. I, I'm thinking about Kyrie Irving, Seth Curry, Joe Harris, Kevin Durant, and Ben Simmons. You got four knockdown shooters, guys who can shoot it from all angles, all over the place, unmotion, off motion, whatever. Doesn't matter. So I have faith in Ben Simmons' talent. It's hard to have faith in Ben Simmons, the person right now, just because you have no idea what's going on in his head and how badly he wants to be good at basketball right now because he hasn't played. He hasn't played basketball. But pie in the sky mentality, this team is freaking good. It's dangerous, and they can crush people. The best teams in the league will have fits trying to guard Kyrie, KD, and Ben Simmons. That's just the fact of it. The other fact of it is we have no freaking clue. So you have to hedge your bet and say Kyrie's going to miss 25 games. Uh, God forbid Kevin Durant misses 15 or something like that. If Ben Simmons wants to play basketball or not, those are all very important question marks to have. But -hmm. if those question marks flip in the favor of the Brooklyn Nets, they are a 50-win team. And maybe I'm now counting too many teams to win over 47 games. I don't really care about that right now because I'm not (laughs) picking all my over-unders yet. But like they are just as good as the Sixers if they're healthy. They're just as good as the Celtics if they are clicking. They can easily be a championship contender if Ben Simmons, I don't need him to shoot. If he doesn't want to shoot, if he has a mental block, if he's Chuck Knobloch, can't throw the ball to first base from second base, I don't I don't care because all those other things he's done that made him an all-NBA level player in Philadelphia, people are forgetting about way too much. So him on the court is positive impact left and right. All day, every day, defensively, offensively. I don't care if he's afraid to shoot. He's really good. And I'm not going to say he's bad until he plays bad basketball. Because all this stuff about him being bad and overrated and yada yada, it has nothing to do with him on the court. It has everything to do with him off the court and one layup that he didn't attempt in that Atlanta Hawks series. So on the court, the impact is undoubtable. And I will expect that to continue if he gets his ass on the court. They have so much talent. I mean, you you look at them, you put them up against like the teams at the top of this list, right? And at their peak, they have sometimes like the best player, maybe the two best players in the series, you know? And then if Ben Simmons is actually playing like Ben Simmons before that, that Hawks series, then you have like maybe the three of the best four or five players in uh, a series. And... The, the thing is, like, you're talking about, like, you don't know what's going on in Ben Simmons' head. And anybody like that, having a guy like that on your team is so – it just messes with you. But you got two guys <laughs> like that on your team who, like, literally the phrase, you don't know what's going on in their heads, like him and Kyrie, right? It's like I see my list and I see the Nets as, like, this – this ghost team that's like hovering. Yeah. It's like if they decide to be this team, then they will be that great. If they decide to be this other team, then they're going to peter out uh, like they did last season and with injuries the season before. And, and this has been Simmons' chance, right? This is his make or break. If he has any desire to fix his reputation, fix his basketball career, he better take this season seriously. He better really try to show up. He better figure out like if Kyrie uh, misses more than 25 games, how he's going to help Kevin Durant win because this is it for him. His reputation is on the line. It's going to be weird. It's going to be weird because there's just, I don't know for, for all the NBA I've watched over the years. I don't know if I've ever seen so much drama with one team. There've been more intense dramas, like people who hate each other, like arguing all the time, but like having like Ben Simmons is his own drama. Right. And then Kyrie is his own drama. And then Kevin Durant is his own drama. And then you have like uh, uh, the weirdness because of Durant with Steve Nash, with Sean Marks. Uh, you know, you, you'd like to think that, yeah, they're, they're just going to figure it out. It's like that, that, that person you grow up with is like, oh man, that person's really smart, really talented. They'll figure it out. But most of the time they don't, <laughs> you know? So like, correct. There's You're a lot 100%. of variables. It's, it's not just a question of like, oh, maybe Kobe and Shaq can get along on the court this season. This is like, can Ben Simmons get his head right? 
can he play well? Uh, can, is his back okay? Kyrie, like, is his head in the game? Is he going to play? Is he going to be injured? Kevin Durant, is he old? Is he going to get injured? Is he going to be just disgruntled? So, like, there's, like, a lot of variables within each of those variables. So uh, it's uh, it's going to be a massive roll of the dice. I actually had them uh, one seed lower at seven, but that's where I'm at with them. Yeah, and, and last thing on the Nets, I think – people also forget because it's so easy to play results. It's so easy to, to remember the most recent thing that that took place. Just like with Ben Simmons, people say he stinks and he's overrated. It's like, no, he's always been properly rated as a very impactful basketball player. The Nets actually played a much closer series than the series score says. It was 4-0. It was a sweep, right? But that first game ended on a buzzer beater. The second game was within a couple points until the last couple minutes or the last minute uh, when they lost by seven. The third game, they lost by six. And the fourth game, they lost by four. They were in all of those games. It was one of the more contested sweeps that I've ever seen. And that first buzzer beater doesn't take place for the Celtics. And that could be a seven-game series. Like, it's so easy to say, oh, they got swept. The Nets suck. They were fake all year. No, I don't play results. I I play process. And process Mm -hmm. on all those games showed me those teams were much more evenly matched. And even though the Celtics got the sweep, the 4-0, whatever, that was one of the tougher series they played. All those wins did not come easily. And then the Celtics kind of took off from there and made their way to the, the to the finals. It's so easy to forget that the Nets were very much in that series, um, even without Ben Simmons, with Kyrie not playing particularly well, and they were still in it because with Kevin Durant, you're always in it. Right, right. And it's weird, right? Because like usually in this kind of like, you know, predictions and rankings and stuff, it's like you're you're basing it on the team, the talent, like what how you perceive they'll they'll be. But with the Nets, it's like you're really just guessing. Like the talent isn't in question. You're guessing on these hypotheticals and these variables that have nothing to do with on the court basketball, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, that's what makes it so, so weird. And it's like, if, if they say, Oh, we have all these doubters. It's like you, you earn those doubters to be honest. Right. Like, so every, it was wrong. Every yeah. one of them, every single one of them. <laughs> Enter- <entertaining. laughs> yeah. anyway, okay. Who you got at seven? Uh, seven. I'm going with Toronto. It's similar yeah. to me with the heat where they have an infrastructure that just works, that they just play, top-notch basketball. I think the Pascal Siakam leap in the second half of the season was not fake. I think Fred Van Vliet and Gary Trent are a more than capable backcourt uh, for Toronto, and I think their wings is where they win. Between OG Ananobi, Scotty Barnes, and they pull in Otto Porter Jr., they got Chris Boucher and Precious, they have depth and they have talent yeah. all the way through. There's not a weak point on this roster. If you want to pick out backup point guard, um, with Malachi Flynn, that's fine. Guess who their backup point guard is in reality? It's Scotty Barnes. That mm-hmm. guy does it all for them on the on the court. Um, I I think that they're just so solid. I mean, they won 48 games last year. Their over under this year is set at just 44 and a half, and I think that's too low. I think that's an underestimation of a coach and a program up in Toronto that has been so solid for a bunch of years now, and they're going to continue to do so. And I talk about leaps so far in this podcast. There's another leap coming for Scotty Barnes. There's another level coming for him. Siakam was still their best player last year uh, from a number standpoint, and he very well may lead them in scoring again. Scotty Barnes is their guy, and they Mm -hmm. have enough Mm -hmm. scoring to go around for them to win a ton of games in the regular season. I love the Raptors this year. I like the Raptors too. Um, I I had them at six. Uh, no, no, actually, <laughs> I had the Hawks at six. Ah, um, nice. Yeah, and uh, I had the uh, the Raptors just under the Nets at eight. It's it's it is again one of those things. Like I think you know the fascinating thing about the last few years of the draft, it's like there have been a lot of hits in the draft. You know what I mean? And so like the influx of talent that, especially in twenty twenty one draft, um, which was supposed to be this great draft and and has proven to be so. There are a lot of teams and a lot of guys that have the potential to be to be great, and a lot of these young teams. And I've said this before: um, you look around the league. You know, there, there used to be teams that were just like the, the franchises that were going nowhere. And yes, there's teams that um, are run poorly that have issues. But even if you want to, like, you know, my favorite whipping boys, the Kings, right? Like, hey, they they actually might be not good, but like better, right? Competitive. And, and uh, so, like, when I look at a team like the Raptors, uh, I, I totally get that the it's the infrastructure, but it's also, like, they just have they – just, 
they just all always really, really play well. And they have like these interchangeable parts that um, I think, as you mentioned, like the wings, uh, that's the most valuable position in the league. And they have these guys who can just, you know, play consistently, play well. But I definitely like the 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 Raptors. I, I love Scotty Barnes. I, I think it was such a, like, the fact that they drafted him instead of Jalen Suggs when everybody thought Suggs was going to be, like, this great fit for them, that was just, that that was, uh, that shows me that they, that infrastructure is, is there and it wasn't just you know having Kawhi having Lowry having DeRozan over those years yeah and and if you think about what where we're at right now in the Eastern Conference we're in that seven eight range now these are good teams you know you already mentioned the Hawks you had them up at six I mentioned the the Raptors and Nets who I had ahead of the Hawks that we didn't even talk about the Bulls yet those teams are playing teams now and that's crazy because they're good teams I mean the Bulls I knew they were going to fall off last year. I think a lot of people did. No one expected them to really make the noise in the playoffs, and they didn't. Uh, But they're a good team. They're going to be good in the regular season. And, you know, four of those six teams are going to end up in the playing game, whether it be, you know, Toronto, Chicago, Brooklyn, Atlanta, Cleveland, whatever. Yeah. Those are, those, some of those teams are playing teams. And that's kind of scary and speaks to your point of how good this league is right now. We haven't gotten to the Bulls officially, the Hornets officially the Knicks officially, the Pistons officially. If some of those teams make a leap, which one of those lower level teams will be much better than we expect. It happens every year. Yeah. Even those teams with a leap, whether it's the the Pistons, the Knicks or, or the Hornets, like they are probably not better than any of the other teams we mentioned so far. So even with a leap, they need a lot of things to break to get in the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, who's your eight? Yeah. For eight, I, it's 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 tough. Regular season, I think the Bulls are just more talented than the Knicks. I think they're more talented than the Hornets. Uh, so I I reluctantly go with the Bulls. I do think the Knicks are right there. I think they're neck and neck. I just think that the um, offensive prowess of Levine and DeRozan outweighs the offensive prowess or lack thereof of Brunson, Barrett, Randall. So I, I I lean slightly over the Bulls, but by the time the season starts, I may talk myself into the Knicks a little bit more. Who knows? I'm, I'm trying not to be a homer here. I just think they're, they're a little bit more solid. They're a little bit more cemented in who does what for that team. You know, I'm very curious to see with the Knicks on, you know, who is their real guy? Mm-hmm. Is it going to be Randall again? Does he come back to life like two years ago? Does Barrett take a leap? Is Brunson have to be the number one option? If that's the case, I'm taking Levine and DeRozan as number one options over the Knicks bunch. Yeah. And, and that's why I give the slight lean to Chicago, but I'm underwhelmed by Chicago. I think we know what they are. We talked about um, all the, com- the competitiveness in this league right now. They're, they're the one that are, they're kind of stuck to me. They're in the little bit of no man's land where they're good and respectable, but they don't have the leap ability to get up to five or six, whereas the Hawks, did I say the Hawks already? I actually skipped no. the Hawks. I think. No, no, no. Oh, I skipped the Hawks. So I, I, I'll, I'll retrace that. But they, the Hawks are above the Bulls for me. I forgot to mention the Hawks. Okay. I already counted them in my head. So the, the so Hawks, I have the Hawks eight? at eight. Yeah, I okay. have the Hawks at eight. At nine is where I'm leaving this question mark. Yeah, because they don't have what it takes to be a four seed. The Hawks do have what it takes yeah. to sneak up on people and be a four seed. And that's the difference in this range of teams here. The Knicks and Bulls, their peak is seven, probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Hawks' yeah. peak is actually four, maybe higher than that, right? Yeah. I don't think they're going to be higher than that. I think they're going to be in that seven, eight range. Um, but they have that juice. They have that extra uh, oomph with DeJounte Murray joining Trey Young down there. So yeah. uh, Hawks yeah. are eight, Bulls are nine for me. Um it's just yeah. like the, the Bulls are a little bit boring in that regard where their ceiling is what it is. And for as solid as they'll be this year, I'm never going to be too excited about a good couple weeks where DeRozan hits four buzzer beaters. You know, the thing about the Bulls is compared to a team like, say, the Raptors, like we talked about, is that the Raptors, you just get this sense, you know, as, as, a, as a fan watching a lot of basketball, like that, oh, like these guys can – can do more like that. Like Scotty Barnes has this something, right? This, these intangibles um, and his ceiling is through the roof. 
And then you look at DeRozan, you look at Zach Levine, and I hundred percent agree. I was not nodding my head. I was like, you know what they are, you know who they are. Uh, DeRozan, he's who he was when he played for the Raptors all those years, right? Not knocking him. He's a, a, a great player, an excellent player for what he does, but I don't worry about Zach Levine or DeMar DeRozan in the playoffs. They don't scare me. And if who knows how long Lonzo Ball is going to be out. Um, I've always been a Pat Williams fan, but uh, obviously he was injured for most of his rookie year or last year. I forgot what it was, but yeah, his second year. Yeah. So he uh, like the Bulls, it's that it, to me, they're like almost like the, the, the trailblazers. The Blazers never scared me because you knew who they were. And, and this to me is like, I don't see uh, DeRozan or Levine dominating a second round playoff series or, or, or a Eastern conference final series and being like, Oh my gosh, he's arrived. Right. Uh, whereas like you even have, even though not my favorite player, Trey young, you know, he's, he's been able to, to show up and, and do things. So um, I have the bulls at like, I think about the nine seed um, at, at that point, the Hawks real quick, <laughs> as much as I don't like Trey young's game, like I think it's, it, it works really well. Uh, and then in this modern game and he got more foul calls and Murray's going to help them through a lot. Um, and they've, they've had some experience, you know, to get past. And I had them at, uh, I think I said six. So, um, yeah. okay. So I have bulls at nine. I think you had bulls at nine. Uh, yeah. what's, what's the rest of your play in round? So with the bulls at nine here, I, I do think the Knicks are the 10th team. Mm-hmm. I think they are here. I think the Hornets, um, with the loss of of Miles Bridges for yeah. his off the court issues that are very bad and he's out of the league right now for good reason that was their variance their their variance was Miles Bridges being good or as being as good or better than LaMelo Ball cuz yeah. realistically last year he took a huge leap and he was very very good for them last year and without him that's a big time hole that they have in their roster so I have the Knicks above the Charlotte Hornets, so I have the Knicks rounding out the play in at number ten, uh, just because I I don't I just don't trust what the what the Hawks have going. Gordon Hayward can't be trusted from a health standpoint. When they have him, they're very good. When they don't, they're not. And now without Miles Bridges, it's even uglier for them. I like some of their other pieces. Like I, I do like PJ Washington. Um, I think Jalen McDaniels is fine. Like Mark Williams could be okay as a center in this league. It's underwhelming. And there's not enough juice there for them to to crack that plan because you're going to need to have a winning record. And I see them more just below 500, and that will not do it in the Eastern Conference this year. Yeah, I mean, I have the Hornets like out of the whole thing just because of the Miles Bridges stuff um, and, and a lot of those things that you already said. For me, in the 10 spot, the final play in, <laughs> I had a slash here. I had Knicks slash Pistons. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. As you know, I'm on the, I actually have the Pistons above the Hornets as well. Uh, I have the Pistons above the Hornets. I think that Cade's taking a leap. I think that um, the they're, they're going to be much more exciting and competitive than the Hornets. And uh, yeah, I just mentioned the Hornets first because they were in it last year. So to give them that yeah. spot from number 10 last year, uh, I do think the Knicks are a little bit more balanced. And I think that Quinton Grimes earns that starting spot. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with Evan Fournier. Mm -hmm. Probably going to be hard for Tibbs to rip off the starting spot band-aid of Evan Fournier just because he is a veteran. He is a good shooter. He has those games where he takes over. But for the Knicks to reach their potential, I need to see more quickly, more Grimes, more McBride. And I think think Grimes of that bunch really asserts himself in that starting bunch or at least the closing bunch if it's not going to be the starting bunch. He's yeah. a really, really good player. Showed some stuff off the dribble more than I, I expected personally. Knockdown shooter, very good defender. He's one of those linchpins that helps out Jalen Brunson, that helps out if Derrick Rose is on the team and healthy uh, to keep solid defense and spacing. I, I love Grimes. And I think this team's solid. Like I think with Mitchell Robinson and, and Toppin with another year under his belt, I think that the holes and bad minutes that existed last year are that much better, and that gets them to the slightly above 500 marker, which would get them in the 10 spot in the plan. My brain says the uh, the Knicks at 10. The fandom in me says, uh, I want to see the Pistons. 
but um, that's probably a, a, a few years away. Yeah, I think their depth is where they lack, right? They they do bring in Alec Burks, which is going to be a great bench piece for the Knicks and against, I'm sorry, for the Pistons and against the Knicks because he left New York now and he was very solid for, for the Knicks off the bench. But you think about Killian Hayes, Hamadou Diallo, and Nerlens Noel, another Knicks guy, like that doesn't feel as solid to me from a depth standpoint. And I think that's where <laughs> they lose. That's where they lose that. But it's, it's actually could be looked at as a positive for the Knicks too. Cause it's not like those players are, are like game changers. Right. So you, you look at that full roster and it puts more weight on Cade and Ivy. And I don't trust Marvin Bagley. I don't think he's a very good player. I don't think he's an efficient player. No. Um, so I, I think where they come short is the depth, but their star power with Cade and Ivy, if Ivy clicks as a rookie, is where they make noise and are exciting. Like they might be a more fun league pass team than the Knicks, but I, I don't think it means more wins. I'll give you uh I'll give you I'll give you some magic thoughts real quick because I think they're gonna be uh sneaky solid. I think the Pacers are probably gonna be the worst team in the Eastern Conference this year. Mm-hmm. Uh the Wizards, who the hell knows? I don't even want to even speak on the Wizards. Who who knows what's going on with them? Yeah. Um this is all I'll say about the magic. They're not a play in team yet. I as much as a as a Cade Cunningham guy I am, I am also a huge Palo Bancaro guy. I mean, he was number one pick. I had him as the number one player in the draft. That dude's huge, Patrick. Like he, when you saw him show up in summer league, you said, oh my God, he is the size of an actual center in today's NBA and moves Mm -hmm. like a wing. He is really, really good. And I think if Suggs takes a little step forward, you get Markel Fultz back for a season. They were much, much better with Markel Fultz last year when he came back from his injury. They're a league pass team to me. They're a team that I will definitely watch oh, a yeah. good bit of, and I'm excited to see what they do. But they're not they're not close yet to a to a play in perspective. Magic are going to be fun to watch. They just need to sort out some of their. I mean, they've so many, they've had so many injuries, and they have all these like guards who do the same thing. So they need to uh, sort all those guys out. But um, all right, well, that is another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. You can find Peter at Pete Kennedy with two Y's on the end. Pete Kennedy, two Y's, or at Subway Sports Talk, either way. Yeah, check him out. Uh, great show. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Patrick Epino, E P I N O, or at Oakland Warriors. You can find Aram at Aram Collier, A R A M C O L L I E R. Find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash Oakland Warriors. Check us out at OaklandWarriors.com and be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in and listen. The Oakland Warriors podcast is produced by National Film Society and is a part of the Basketball Podcast Network. And if you're so inclined, please do leave us a five star rating on Spotify and or Apple Podcasts and leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts. That is always super Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time and go Dubs.